Good afternoon, everybody who's logging into our call today. Um, we will give it a minute or two for people to complete the process of logging in and we'll get started shortly. Sorry for the delay there. I uh, did an introduction for everybody uh, and realized that I've been on mute the whole time. So good afternoon, everybody. This is Paul Keeley. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at the National Low Income Housing Coalition, and I want to welcome all of you to this week's national call on coronavirus disasters, housing, and homelessness. 
As always, today ha today's call has low-income residents, people with lived experience, with homelessness, homeless shelter and services providers, affordable housing providers and advocates from around the country, as well as members of the media, staff from congressional offices, and others. Um, during today's call, we'll discuss the evolving negotiations in Congress on a coronavirus relief package and the urgent need for advocates to make a final push to secure rent relief now. We'll hear from economist Mark Zandi in a minute on estimates of back rent owed and the need for emergency rental assistance, learn about a new tool for equitable COVID-19 homelessness response, receive updates from the field and more. It is my pleasure to introduce Mark Zandi, Chief Economist at Moody's Analytics, where he directs economic research. He is a trusted advisor to policymakers and an influential source of economic analysis for businesses, journalists, and the public. Dr. Zandi frequently test testifies before Congress, and he is a frequent guest on CNBC, NPR, Meet the Press, CNN, and other national networks and news programs. I see him frequently and I'm often, uh, always actually, uh, so impressed by his expertise and his analysis. Dr. Zandi will talk to us um, about some work he's done on estimates of back rent owed by renters during the pandemic and the need for emergency rental assistance. So without further ado, Mark. Thank you, Paul. Uh, very kind of you to have me. And uh, I want to thank you and uh, NLIHC for the opportunity. Um, oh, the, uh, the, the mute uh, button is, uh, is a, a plagues everyone, Paul. So uh, don't worry <laughs> about it. It's uh, been there many times before. So Diane asked me to weigh in on um, a bit on the rental eviction crisis, uh, which I know you all are living uh, firsthand. Uh, uh, I, I've done a bit of work trying to estimate the amount of back rent that uh, is owed, and it's made its way into the popular press and into the policy debate. And she uh, asked me to uh, give you a little bit more granularity as to how I came up with the estimate and exactly what I'm measuring. So that's what I'm going to do. So if you turn to the first slide, uh, this, I know there's a lot of numbers here, but uh, I'll, let me just walk through it. So the, the number that uh, people are using for me uh, is uh, that the total amount of back rent due is $70 billion. And that's an estimate as of what will be due uh, come January 2021, obviously when uh, the eviction moratoria expires uh, uh, at the current uh, if everything kind of sticks to the current script. Uh, to be more precise, that $70 billion represents the amount of back rent utilities that are due uh, for all rental borrowers. Uh, so, excuse me, for all renters. So uh, not just those that have been impacted by uh, the pandemic through unemployment or underemployment. This is uh, all uh, renters. Uh, I'm also including um, uh, uh, late penalties. So you know, most landlords will charge a late fee if you're late. So I also included that in, in the estimate. Uh, one other big assumption, and I'll come back to it in just a minute, is this assumes that lawmakers, Congress and the administration can't get it together and they do not pass another fiscal rescue pack package. So there's no additional uh, fiscal support. And that's important because uh, without that support, uh, the broader economy, uh, which is already struggling because of the reintensification of the, of the virus, will start to suffer and probably already has begun to suffer job losses uh, again and rising unemployment. And that contributes to my estimate of the number of renters that will uh, be delinquent on their rent come January uh, 2021. Uh, you can see uh, I am, I should also say that, you know, there is no government source uh, for this data. So it's an estimate based on a large uh, number of other uh, sources. Uh, I'm using the Census Bureau's Household Pulse Survey. This is a survey 
that census began soon after the pandemic hit to provide more granularity, more information about uh, the fallout from the pandemic on the economy. And a uh, 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 good website, uh, highly recommend it, uh, provides lots of information with regard to this issue. Um, I'm also using the Bureau of Labor Statistics Consumer Expenditure Survey. This is an annual survey. We have 2019 data. I'm using that information uh, to get at the cost of rent and utilities. Uh, one other um, point of interest, uh, my estimates of, of the rent and utilities uh, do reflect uh, across uh, where I think uh, uh, we'll see more delinquent uh, renters. It is a function of uh, the pandemic doing more damage to the economy and uh, causing more problems for renters uh, in uh, urban areas where uh, rents and utility costs tend to be higher than in other areas. So the estimate of rent and back, the back rent and utilities that are due also reflects uh, the fact uh, that the pandemic has hit some parts of the country harder than, than others. Uh, I'm also using the Census uh, Housing Vacancy Survey uh, to, to provide more uh, broader estimates of a number of renter households and some other information. I, I use Equifax, the Credit Bureau. We collect very good data on uh, uh, late mortgage payments based on uh, credit file information. And I use that to help uh, construct estimates of the uh, average amount of months uh, renters are behind uh, under the assumption that renters uh, are as behind on their rent payments as delinquent mortgage borrowers are on their mortgage payments. Uh, it's a, I think that's a conservative estimate, uh, but, uh, but uh, use the Equifax data for, for that. And then of course, uh, uh, bring it all together uh, in, in these estimates. So uh, uh, $70 billion in, in back rent and utilities due as, as of January, 2021. You can see we're estimating uh, that there will be 11.5 million delinquent renters at that point in time. According to the Pulse, the household, uh, the Census Household Pulse Survey, as of the last survey, which was done uh, around Thanksgiving, uh, there were uh, roughly 9 million delinquent renters. So I do expect, given the weakening economy and the prospects for job loss and higher unemployment here in the next couple of months, that that will add to the number of delinquent renters. Uh, I'm estimating that the typical delinquent renter will owe just over $6,000. And you can see how I get there. Uh, rent and utilities of $1,400, a little over $1,400 a month, a late pay penalty payment of 50 bucks a month. And the typical renter is behind by uh, just about four months. So if you just do the arithmetic, uh, you get an estimate of about $70 uh, billion, uh, uh, the estimate that th that's being used. Um, as I said, that the key, one of the key assumptions here is that there will be no additional fiscal support. And um, obviously Congress and the administration are in the middle of negotiations around uh, providing more support. So if we do get a fiscal relief package, another fiscal relief package, and the one that's uh, been at the foremost recently is a $900 billion package, which includes uh, more money for unemployment insurance, uh, it includes uh, a rental assistance fund, I, I believe at $25 billion, more PPP money and sundry other things for other industries, testing and tracing uh, for education and, and uh, other needs. Uh, if that uh, package is passed, then the economy is going to struggle here over the next few months given the raging pandemic. But it, it, in all likelihood, will uh, navigate through without serious job loss. Unemployment will hold steady. And you can see, uh, I don't expect nearly as many delinquent borrower, uh, renters as of uh, January. And the total cost of the packet uh, of, the, of the back rent and utilities will be closer to $57 billion. So, uh, you know, if we, if, if lawmakers do uh, what, what is, uh, uh, appropriate, past that $900 billion package, uh, the overall costs will be, will be lower, closer to $57 billion. One other quick point of interest, um, if you look at the survey information from census, uh, it indicates that roughly half 
a little less than half of renters who are currently delinquent feel that there's a reasonably high probability that they will face eviction. Uh, so uh, if that's the case, uh, you can take the $57 billion uh, divide by two, and that's the amount of cash that would be needed, the amount of support that would be needed uh, to uh, help uh, bring current all the renters who uh, believe that they will uh, face eviction. Now, of course, uh, that, that's not what I would recommend. That feels like where lawmakers seem to be ending up that $25 billion rental assistance fund feels like it's roughly consistent with that kind of logic. Uh, you know, obviously uh, th uh, that's just enough to get renters uh, uh, back current, but uh, it doesn't reduce the odds that they'll get uh, evicted down a month or two later if they can't make uh, that rental payment again. So, you know, good policy would, uh, would uh, put forward, would ante up a, a bigger fund to help not only with the back rent that's due, but also help with future rent to make sure that these these folks don't uh, get evicted a month or two or three down the road. So uh, uh, I would advocate for a, a larger rental assistance package, but I, I do think the package that lawmakers have come up with here is, is roughly consistent with uh, these kind of numbers. Uh, finally, just to strike, uh, a point around the importance of the relief package to home. Uh, the, the next slide, the last slide I want to show is uh, to give you a sense of things, what happens, um, what, what happens under different fiscal policy assumptions. Uh, we, we lost the legend here, so I'll just explain this. This is the unemployment rate from the first quarter of 2019 through the end of 2024 under uh, three different fiscal policy scenarios. The orange line represents the unemployment rate if we get that $900 billion package. So it's just enough to keep the economy from uh, backtracking. Unemployment remains stable through 2021 and begins to improve later in the year, particularly uh, as we move into 22 and three, as the economy gains traction on the other side of the pandemic. Uh, that's, that's the baseline, the, the most likely scenario, the, ho the hopeful scenario. But just to give you a sense of what happens if we don't get a, a rescue package, that's the green line, that's the unemployment rate uh, with no additional support. Uh, and you can see unemployment rises from here in 2021, despite the good news uh, on the pandemic later in the year with the, with the vaccine. Uh, that's, that's a recession, that's a double dip recession. And you know, why uh, the costs of, of assisting renters delinquent renters will be much greater under that scenario. And just to bookend things, the blue line represents uh, the unemployment rate if we get a much larger, for whatever reason, package. I mean, per perhaps Democrats win the Senate race in Georgia. So we have a democratic government and they're able to pass a much larger package, 2.25 trillion, that's the blue line. That's consistent with the package that was being debated before the election. And you get a obviously a much, uh, better outlook for uh, unemployment. And uh, that translates in, into uh, much fewer numbers of uh, delinquent uh, uh, renter, or renters. Uh, and uh, uh, that would be very important. But uh, I think this uh, makes clear how important it is for lawmakers to get it together here as quickly as possible to pass a fiscal rescue package uh, for many reasons, least of which is to uh, ensure that we don't have a, a true rental eviction crisis uh, in just a few weeks. Uh, with that, Paul, I'll, I'll stop and, and turn the conversation back to you. Thank you, Mark. That's really, really, really helpful. Um, we do have a couple of questions uh, in our Q&A box here that I'd like to pass along to you. Uh, one is, do you have this information broken down by state? Yeah, we do, uh, and I'm, I am writing a paper uh, that I'm hopeful I get. I'll publish tomorrow, where I'll provide that information, and I'm, I'll make sure Paul, you get that so that you can distribute it to everyone on the call so that they have that. Okay, and that is a promise to everybody on the call that we will, in fact, distribute it to you. If you've been on this call, there was a question about whether we would be sharing these slides, and we will, uh, as we do with all the slides that are presented on these calls. 
Um, another question here was, um, is the delinquent dollar number per all renters or just per the delinquent renters only? This is uh, the, the dollar amount owed by all renters who are delinquent on their, on their payment, uh, on their rental payment. So if you haven't made a rental payment, uh, then you would be included in, uh, in this estimate, this $70 billion estimate. It, it, it's agnostic with regard to you know, why you're delinquent. You, know, you could be delinquent because you're unemployed, because you lost your job because of the, in a restaurant because of the pandemic, but that isn't necessarily, uh, that, that isn't the only reason. All, for, if, you, if you're delinquent for whatever reason, you'd be included in that estimate. Great, and as you're pointing out, there are other people who have been struggling and maybe just getting by, uh, but this does not take into that into consideration the need for rental assistance for those households come January 1st, let's say. No, so yeah, you could be struggling. In fact, another interesting data point, I mean, heartbreaking data point from the poll survey is just how uh, large a percentage of uh, borrowers are relying on family and friends to kind of make it through and make their rent payment. For delinquent borrowers, uh, roughly half are getting some form of help from uh, friends and family to make that rent payment. So that gives you a real sense of things. So yeah, you could be making the payment, but you, you're piecing it together every month and you know uh, using all of your uh, resources to do it. Or in, in many cases, as we've seen, paying by credit card. And of course, that's continue to be debt that, that you're going to owe. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you're exactly right. So uh, credit card, uh, the use of credit cards to make rent payments has, has risen. Of course, many of the delinquent borrowers have kind of tapped out their credit cards long ago. So it's, you know, a small percentage of, 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 of troubled renters are using cards, but that it is on the rise. So again, to the point that, you know, whatever res financial resources households have, to make their rent payment, they, they are using them. There's another good question here, and, and we'll wrap up with this one because uh, of time, but I, there's a question here. We keep hearing from our state apartment association, their rents, rent receipts are only one to 2% below this time last year. How does that square with your finding? Is it a matter of what kinds of landlords belong to such an association? Uh, how should advocates like those on this call respond to those claims versus your data? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think that's just, um, one of the problems here is uh, a lack of a good, uh, consistent data source, uh, and I think you know we're getting different pictures of what's going on by, depending on which part of the elephant, so to speak, you're 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 touching, and the elephant that that data that was referred to is probably touching are kind of landlords that you know are catering to households are doing just fine, you know many. Uh, borrower, many of the delinquent renters uh, live in uh, homes that are managed by kind of mom and pop landlords, and they're probably not reporting. Uh, so I think it's just not picking up, you know, what's going on out there uh, in many communities. All right. All right. Thank you. Mark, thank you so much for this presentation. It's incredibly valuable, incredibly important for us to get this uh, information to policymakers, and we are. Uh, so thank you for all of your work, and we really appreciate you joining our call today. Sure thing. Thanks, Paul. All right. Take care. Okay, we're going to move on now to our next presenter, and that is Brittany Manzo from National Innovation Service. She's going to talk about a new tool for ensuring a more equitable COVID-19 homelessness response. Brittany, are you there? Yeah, I am. Thank you so much for having me back on today. Uh, good morning, everyone from the West Coast. Good afternoon to the folks on the East Coast uh, and elsewhere. I am really excited to share with you all the latest tool in the framework for an equitable COVID response toolbox. Uh, sorry for the back and forth on the slides. I was just getting used to it. Uh, so the tool we're going to be talking about today was developed uh, by the National Innovation Service. Um, through our partnership with all of the organizations you see on your screen through the Framework for an Equitable COVID-19 Homelessness Response Project. Uh, the tool we'll be, we'll be talking about is actually a series of quizzes. 
candidly, I was inspired by my girlfriend who sends me at least two BuzzFeed quizzes a week. Uh, this week, I learned that the color of my soul is purple and my dream home is apparently in New Mexico. I'm not sure what to do with the fact that I have a purple soul, but BuzzFeed made me realize that um, assessments with tailored personalized recommendations can maybe be helpful in helping us move from theory to action. Um, so earlier this year, we uh, rolled out an equity-based decision-making framework or guidance as a part of this toolbox that, that I mentioned earlier. It walks through how to make equity-based or equity-centered decisions when it comes to policy and strategy, hiring, contracting, or business operations. I just dropped a link to that guidance in the chat. We got really great feedback. Um, so we wanted to take it a step further in helping folks operationalize it. What does it look like practically step-by-step -step, to prioritize equity when we have power in our hands, when we're making a decision? Uh, this is a really important tool because it helps us move from the what and the why of racial equity that we've spent so much time talking about um, to the how and when. Um, these quizzes or assessments can help you take the next step in centering equity in your work. So um, let's talk through how it works. I will drop a, another link in the chat to the assessments themselves. Um, and you can do them online. They're all, it's all web-based. Uh, so you'll want this link here. When you go to take an assessment, when you're ready uh, to maybe carve out five minutes of your day to do something a little less rigorous, uh, you'll want to have an example of your work in your hands. What's a process or a policy you are part of influencing or managing? Um, pull that up, put it in front of you. Um, it could be a policy document. It could, um, honestly, it could be a thread of emails that document a process you are a part of. Um, it could involve reflecting back on a table you sat at or, or a process you participated in. Uh, from there, you'll want to choose the area of your work uh, that is, is most applicable. You'll be choosing between policy, business operations, or hiring. Um, and from there, you'll um, pick a subsection, a place to start. Um, the assessments are short, so don't worry about picking the exact right assessment to start with. They're intended to be picked up when you have time for them. Um, they're all short, so, so you'll be able to circle back, hopefully, and take another. Um, once you have your example in front of you, you just click take the assessment to get started. Um, so I thought today we could use my time with you all to, um, to walk through one together, to walk through an assessment together. I'm going to use a policy document that I developed when I was at the US Interagency Council on Homelessness as an example. Um, not important what the example is, but I'll tell you anyway, it's the enhancing coordinated entry through partnerships with mainstream resources and programs. I worked on that document and I thought it was a really good example of how, um, how I approached my policy work at USICH. Um, so this is related to my work on policy and strategy. So as you can see, that is the assessment I chose. Um, and I'm going to start with the accessibility and clarity assessment. So here's our first question. Does the document define acronyms or jargon that wouldn't be easily understood by someone who's not well versed in our system? Uh, let's see, the document has at least one acronym that's not defined, it's TANF, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, but it just says TANF, it doesn't tell anybody what that is. So my answer to this question is gonna be no. Um, we're just working today as an example of how the quiz, how the assessment works. So I'm gonna move pretty quickly through the next four questions. So you can see uh, how the recommendations are, are put together. So our next question is whether the document clearly states its purpose um, and uh, how the information should be used. Yes, the document is very clear about that. Uh, do I think a seventh grader could understand this? Could my little cousin Sophia wrap her head around this? I don't think so. It is not that clear, so I'm gonna say no. Is the document translated into common languages? No, it is only in English. So that's the assessment. And here are my personalized recommendations. So the, I know the, the screen's a little blurry here, but this is just an example of what your tailored recommendations look like. Um, and honestly, how long they are. It's pretty simple. Um, 
you can, if you're curious how we came to these recommendations, take a look back at the guidance we released earlier this year. These are the practical next steps around how to create an open community oriented equity based process to make your decisions locally um, or nationally. This is this tool. One thing I'm really proud of with this is that it's widely applicable, not even just to homeless services, though that is the language we use here. It's um, it's a good lens to to analyze any process or any decision making uh, uh, any decision making that you do to to figure out if you're centering equity, to figure out if you're centering folks most impacted by the by the issue at hand. So how should we use it? How can this be used? Honestly, it's fun. It's fun to, to take a quiz and, and put a different part of your brain on. So play around, um, see what the different, the different recommendations are. Um, you don't always have to use it in you know, the, the most specific of ways. Um, so play around with it, share it with your colleagues, um, and then integrate the recommendations into your workflow as they apply. Um, and, and the more you find this useful, the more you'll be able to make an argument um, or, or put a process in place to institute equity-based decision-making yourself. Um, so the assessments can be a monitoring tool, they can be a suggestion tool if you do decide to put the framework into place, or it can just um, help you hone your own skills around implementing equity-oriented equity uh, processes. This helps us move a little bit away from the bureaucracy of our work back towards centering people experiencing homelessness and those most impacted by housing instability. Um, so I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Paul, to see if we have any questions, but I wanna share that my email inbox is wide open for folks. If you have feedback, if you have questions, if you have successes about how you're using this, I would love, love to hear um, how and whether it's valuable to folks. Fantastic, Brittany. Thank you so much. The, uh, the... <laughs> I wrote jotted down a, fun, a few things as I was listening to you. Number one, you know, acronyms and jargon. Uh, not not that any of us are guilty of that. Um, <laughs> yeah, but the other thing that I just was so impressed with is, you know, you said it's fun, and you know, you've really created something that's quick, and that's easy to use, and and as you said, it's fun to use, and it's just a, a great tool. Thank you so much for sharing that. I'm not seeing any questions just now um, specifically to you. So if you have an opportunity to hang on for a little while and see if additional questions come into the Q&A box or into the chat, that would be great. Uh, but we will share, sure will. We'll share this presentation and we'll share the link uh, more broadly to the entire group and encourage everybody to use this. What a, what a phenomenal tool. Th thank you so much. Okay, now we're gonna move on to our field updates and our first presenter is Kate Watson from the Kansas Statewide Homeless Network. Kate, you there? Yes, I am here. Thank you very much for having me. I just wanna make one slight correction. It's Kansas Statewide Homeless Coalition. Okay, great. Yeah, no worries. Um, well, I just wanted to share kind of what's starting to happen in Kansas related to uh, rolling out the vaccine. Um, I got an interesting phone call a couple of weeks ago um, from um, some public health folks that wanted to know if I was interested in joining the state's Kansas COVID vaccine planning committee that will determine the plans for the distribution of the vaccine across the state. And just so happens it was an old colleague of mine because I spent about 15 years in public health. And so I have pretty extensive experience uh, working in chronic disease specifically, but I was also on the um, H1N1 and Ebola uh, preparedness uh, teams in, in Kansas that have worked very closely with the CDC for many years. So, uh, you know, each, each group has their own language, just like people in the homeless and, and housing insecure areas. So it is, so is it with public health. So it's a very nice bridge, I think, um, to be a part of this group. 
And I think it's really critical that they, they had one meeting and during that meeting, uh, their discussion was around what sectors are not represented here on this committee. And fortunately, they determined that um, the needs for having a homeless uh, representation was critical uh, area to identify um, some of those not always thought about groups. And so the, the plan is very similar in every state has to have a state vaccine distribution plan. And so goes the way of Kansas. Um, and so just to, to give you um, a little bit of the high, highlight of the challenges in uh, distribution for a state like, state like Kansas, I'll just give you a really brief um, Kansas 101, if you will. Um, a lot of folks that aren't familiar, familiar with Kansas think that they, we are Kansas City and, and that's about it, which is partially true, but um, much of our state is very rural and we have at least 36 counties out of our 105 counties that are frontier counties, meaning there's only six people per square mile. But that does not mean that there aren't homeless people in those areas of the state. In fact, we know that there are, they're just sometimes not always quite as visible. Um, so what this planning group, uh, and I'm sorry, it's gonna be an acronym, it's COVAC, uh, what the planning group is, is working on is some CDC recommendations on the phases that the vaccination uh, distribution will roll out. And today was day one of that distribution in some um, finite areas of the country. And I'm sure most of you are probably aware of that. Um, the, um, the plan, um, is really a recommendation from CDC to have a phased approach. And I'm sure most of you are aware that uh, this is what's been being talked about in the news. Essentially, Kansas is taking those recommendations uh, from the CDC to have a phased approach. The first phase, of course, we all know that they're going to be our frontline workers, our healthcare workers and such. And they started this process in Kansas back in September uh, to get uh, healthcare providers enrolled. So it was a pretty extensive process going through getting, the, getting providers across the state and enrolled in a system so that they can collect data on how many people are getting vaccinated, what are, are there any bad outcomes, um, you know, demographic information and what have you. So, um, and it was interesting, you know, hearing uh, Brittany talk about um, equity um, and the plan that uh, CDC has has submitted to the states was information that they gleaned from the National Academy of Sciences, Medicine, and Engineering framework for equitable allocation. So I was really happy to, to see that connection because what they're focusing on is really something that is going to be equitable equitable across all population groups. And so I think it was really interesting and, and, and had a lot of foresight that they realized that the homeless population uh, was a group that they, they needed to um, have involved and have representation from. So in, in the second phase, in terms of people who are homeless and uh, having listened to Mark's presentation, you know, there's going to be more of those people, unfortunately, uh, unless that we, unless we can, as a group, do something um, to change the trajectory of some of those numbers. But as it stands it, in Kansas, the distribution um, for critical um, groups is going to be mostly in phase two. So. The um, equitable allocation um, framework shows that in phase two, specifically people in homeless shelters or group homes for individuals with disabilities, including serious mental illness, developmental and intellectual disabilities, and physical disabilities or in recovery, and staff who work in such settings. 
So how how are we going to do that? Well, you know, that that is what the committee is going to determine. So Kansas, unlike some other states, um, has a public health system that is um, decentralized, meaning that um, all of the local health departments across the state are, are not intric intricately connected to the state health department. Um, and then some states are who are funded right through their, their uh, state health departments to all their local health departments. So in those states, there's a little bit more of a seamless um, tr transition to get a vaccine out. So in a state like Kansas that is decentralized to coordinate all of our local health departments that we have at least almost one in every state there in our more rural states, there may be a health department that uh, covers two counties and some of those health departments have one and two people on staff. So that's one barrier to getting this vaccination out. And um, the other barrier is getting it distributed to the um, organizations that provide services to homeless um, people and to people that are at risk of becoming homeless. So their distribution so far is gonna take place in, in that phase two that I, that, I men, that I mentioned earlier. So that's in terms of, I don't think they really know at this point um, what the timing is going to be. We know the country is starting into phase one now. Uh, as I understand it, just from the news this morning, um, the uh, general population will not have access to it until possibly the end of May or June. Now, th those timeframes are going to obviously change depending on, you know, what kind of challenges that each state uh, encounters with uh, relation to getting uh, all the folks in uh, those phases uh, vaccinated. So what my uh, goal will be to uh, present to the COVAC or the COVID Vaccine Planning Committee here in Kansas is that we will need to garner support from our network of providers. And we, we don't know really how many of the homeless and those at risk for homeless in Kansas we really don't know how many of those have been impacted by COVID. We're just starting to collect that data and, and that will be um, critical, I think, for us um, in the coming months. But my hope also is um, that the uh, committee will also be using, they'll be using a geographic information system to map those critical populations where we don't really have data so I'm, I'm hoping that we'll have another source of data to collect um, information on, on those most uh, often overlooked uh, in our state. Um, and, and then the other problem that, that, I, that I see that's going to happen and not only in Kansas, but in, in states across the country is I'm sure you all have heard that the messaging is gonna be critical. We have a, uh, we have a number of folks that do not believe in vaccinations. And it's, um, it was brought to my attention and very surprising to me. Uh, one of the representatives on our committee was the, uh, the state's uh, nursing association. And she reported that 30% of the nurses across Kansas did not wanna take the vaccine. So if we can't convince our frontline health workers, we've got a big hill to climb to get that message out to, to folks to assure them this is something that, um, that we know is needed, uh, but we can certainly understand how folks might be skeptical. And I'm sure there's folks on this call that, that are skeptical. Um, I, coming from public health, have a little bit more, um, I feel a little bit more secure in, in getting that uh, vaccine, but Again, the messaging is going to be critical, and then also finding the folks uh, that may not be in any of our um, provider organizations, whether it's emergency shelters or uh, 
any kind of housing assistance, but especially those folks that are unsheltered, it would be extremely difficult. Um, so I, I thank you for allowing me to give you a little snapshot of the middle of the country. We're actually exactly in the middle of the country. Um, so I, if you have questions, I would be happy to entertain those questions, but um, thank you all for listening. And I appreciate, I would appreciate any advice uh, or sage advice that you've got any of you have to um, send my way if you have a mind to do so. And if you do, thank you in advance for that. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, it's it's great that you're applying an equitable framework approach to this and doing that. I don't see how anyone can conclude that uh, people experiencing homelessness would not be a critical group, uh, you know, phase two group. Um, and th there was a comment here uh, from William Higgins who said CDC has data on positive COVID testing for homeless and shelter staff. Um, so I just wanted to share that because you said you know, you're still sort of struggling with the number that have in, been impacted by COVID. Um, you, clearly, what the comment that you're making about the critical nature of messaging and, and finding those who are not in your provider systems is going to be extremely, extremely important. Um, and I'll just share that uh, one of our participants, Jerry Poet, said, uh, thank you so much for bringing public health expertise to it the community most in need. And thanks for sharing your Kansas experience with us on the Zoom call. Um, there's a question from Jerry uh, who says, you know, how, how does misinformation challenge your work? I think you referred to that a little bit, but I don't know if you want to say anything more about that. How does mis misinformation? Um, yeah. Well, right. it, you know, I, I did allude to that uh, somewhat in my remarks um, that um, some people like the nurses uh, across the state that don't want to take the va vaccine, that certainly would be um, a, a critical group to um, challenge them about how they message. Um, and, and uh, you know, I don't have a magic wand. I, I really don't know how um, you would change someone's mind that's in that profession and sees, I just don't understand uh, that if they're seeing the, the horrible effects of this disease, how they could not want to take the vaccine. But um, I, I think it's just gonna have to be uniform and clear and easy to understand messaging. Uh, public health has done that forever. Um, and you can go all the way back to uh, looking at the smoking rates uh, back in the 1950s compared to now, and that's public health working it working as hard as they could in the background. This will be the same. Only I think they're going to be much more working in the foreground because everybody is acutely aware of um, the challenge of this disease. So. I, I appreciate that question. I'm not sure that I gave it uh, as good an answer as what was expected though, but I maybe think, I'll have I better think. information hopefully in another month. Thank you, Kate. It really does occur to me that uh, your, your thought about how we have to really do great messaging and it's gotta be simple and it's gotta be clear that, that uh, the, uh, the tool that Brittany Manzo just shared with us could be really valuable to you in that work. So. Uh, good luck, and uh, we may be asking you back to, to give us an update. Thank you so much, Kate. Uh, thank you. Okay, we're going to move now to Alyssa Margolin um, from Housing New Hampshire uh, to give us a, an update from that state. Uh, Alyssa? Thank you, Paul. Uh, I want to start off by thanking you and your team at the National Low Income Housing Coalition for your unwavering advocacy during this challenging time. And thank you for the platform to share our work at the state level. As Paul said, I serve as director. The name of our organization is actually Housing Action New Hampshire. We stole it from another state partner in Illinois. Um, and so when you're ready to share uh, the, um, my PowerPoint, I can go ahead and get started.
Let's go ahead and double click on the screen. Great, thank you. So the, this is my second time presenting on your pandemic response webinars. I believe that I um, was here uh, early on in the pandemic, perhaps it was April. And at that point, I was able to share with you the advocacy that we have been doing to encourage the state to respond to the decompression and quarantine needs for homeless shelters. A lot of uh, intense messaging was going on to describe uh, what it was like uh, for uh, residents and staff in the shelters and how they were so vulnerable to the spread of COVID-19. And as a result, um, some uh, uh, coordinated response in providing resources to lower the census inside, particularly uh, emergency shelters. Uh, you know, large, which essentially are just, you know, large rooms with bunk beds two feet apart that we've, we've all learned now is a, a ripe for spreading the disease. But also uh, with um, the advocacy uh, created a statewide quarantine sites for uh, anyone who had uh, was experiencing the disease who had tested positive. Um, and so, um, that early advocacy uh, proved really important as resources started to come into the state. And I believe that I did update uh, the group about our success in securing a statewide housing stabilization fund called the New Hampshire Housing Relief Fund from our coronavirus relief fund, as well as a program to deal with uh, physical improvements and operational improvements needed for our homeless shelter system to cope with the disease. We were able to get these resources out really quickly. I will uh, start by saying that philanthropy was a key partner as we um, worked the administrative mechanisms required to make state and federal resources our friends for response. Um, our statewide uh, community foundation, the New Hampshire Charitable Foundation, launched a community crisis fund that um, dedicated uh, major funding to uh, the homeless services system. Uh, in addition, they are coming through for us as we try to bridge funding to fund uh, an ongoing uh, testing program that I'll, I'll get to in a moment. Um, but we, um, we were able to uh, quickly amend our, um, our, our state action plan with HUD so that we could use ESG for pandemic response. So um, that's ESG CV, but we were able to expand our street outreach, make resources available for rapid rehousing. Um, the New Hampshire Housing Relief Program um, once uh, launched just at the time that our state moratorium on eviction expired. And um, we learned quickly in the first couple of weeks of the program that trying to collect data was slowing the, um, the, the opportunity to get resources out quickly. So um, uh, through some good collaboration and advocacy able to uh, change the application process to get those funds out. Um, and uh, once we started to hear from Housing Action New Hampshire members, particularly landlord members, that um, folks were becoming current with rent, we knew that the program was a success. Uh, Housing Action New Hampshire also had the opportunity to serve on the review board for one of the uh, new resources, our shelter modification program. Um, and provide uh, both insight and TA and bridge information from uh, the uh, folks administering that program to the shelter system. It was a tall order to say that we were going to make infrastructure improvements and in dealing with the um, CARES Act deadline of December 30th, but I'm pleased to say that um, we, we were able to uh, make 
tremendous progress. Um, great partnerships with uh, friends in uh, large uh, construction outfits, um, uh, just a flexibility among uh, those who recognize the urgency of getting a lot of these improvements done quickly. We still were able to acquire um, nine additional sites for de decompression. And we are now working with those shelter leaders and the funders to look at some longer term planning to shift those from shelter to a more supportive housing, housing first approach. So trying to make what was a short term need into a longer term asset. Uh, we also saw um, CDBGCV uh, open for public services more than ever before. Um, we uh, were, <laughs> we didn't know, of course, when we increased our eviction prevention dollars at the state level, the budget year prior, that we would need them for the pandemic. But when, um, for whatever reason, an applicant would not um, be eligible for New Hampshire Housing Relief Program, say, for example, they could not substantiate COVID-related income loss, um, the state eviction prevention program could kick in um, and supplement uh, when, um, when the uh, CARES Act funding was not available. Again, as I mentioned earlier, our state moratorium expired. Um, however, the CDC eviction moratorium uh, was um, in place, uh, I think just sh very shortly after. The results of getting the resources out quickly and of the supportive policy landscape is that right now, um, a snapshot in New Hampshire, evictions are at an all time low. Um, according to the judicial branch, we have about half of the number of evictions um, that we had the year prior. And we realize that um, this is due to the, to the resources that we have been able to uh, operationalize and also the policy uh, connected to the eviction moratorium and that we're about to hit a cliff for both of these. Our housing stabilization program supported rent but also mortgages as well up to $2,500 per applicant for mortgage needs but also uh, utility assistance. Our, um, I mentioned our shelter decompression and improvements um, and the long-term impact we hope that will have on services and uh, hopefully an uh, proved commitment to a supportive housing and housing first model. And now we're able to implement um, both PCR and antigen testing for our homeless shelters, which as we've learned is an important screening tool we were able to launch a PCR testing program, interestingly enough, with our state university system. So our UNH, so University of New Hampshire Innovation Lab has become a partner for us through Housing Action New Hampshire's state adaptation program. And we're making um, the PCR LAMP uh, methodology testing available to shelters. In addition, the state has provided that antigen testing, so that Binex Now testing, which is helpful for symptomatic residents. I think our ongoing concerns here in the Granite State are around the uh, encampments issue and of course the resource cliff that we know that we're about to face. For the 529 participants on today's webinar, I think all of you know that encampments exist. But I think in many times the general population, particularly in a state like ours, may not be aware that um, how prevalent encampments can be. In one case, in our largest city, um, the, one of the encampments on state property was very visible to uh, anyone working downtown. And that became um, a big focus of media, of uh, a bit of political tension. And we very much tried to um, convert uh, this um, 
attention to the issue to action. In addition, as I mentioned, we are very concerned about the cliff that we are about to take. Alyssa? Yes, I'm here. Uh, given, given the uh, kind of tight time constraints we have, um, can, we, uh, can we just wrap kind of quickly? Yes, we just have a couple more slides. OK, thanks. Um, so um, on, after the um, attention to the encampments issue, um, the governor appointed a new council on housing stability. This replaced our state interagency council on homelessness. And uh, the governor tasked the new council on housing stability uh, to recommend uh, uh, new uh, policy proposals for our 2021 legislative session. And that framework was finalized last week and um, so uh, and uh, articulated support for some uh, legislation that has been in play at our state house before to incentivize development at the local level, also support for our state housing trust fund, as well as the department's request for an increase in shelter case management. Um, the task force also, um, the um, rather the council has also created a task force to meet with the governor to explore approaches to eviction prevention, including an extension of the federal moratorium, an extension of right to cure, and or mandating a discretionary stay for all non-payment cases for at least 30 days after the state of emergency. We're um, focusing on using this opportunity and this attention to our issue on building uh, on this engagement and this wider uh, interest in our issues. So we're trying to make sure that um, there's consensus around uh, housing focus, around supportive housing approach, bring in new champions, make the most of the media attention. And of course, uh, the most uh, as we go into our, uh, what is our state budget year in 2021. To conclude, I'll say that um, I think lessons learned for us here right now in the state is that you really philanthropy can be a really important ally and can really help um, as we as you try to uh, wait for either federal or state resources to become operational. It's helpful to get into the regulatory weeds um, to understand what resources can be used for what and to respect when. Um, an agency is just saying, I can't use that for X purpose. Um, ju just as you've done at the national level, we are finding the power of weekly webinars and Zooms and info sessions and blast emails. It feels like you can't say something uh, just once. You need to repeat it several times in order for it to take those frequent check-ins. Um, we recognize, as, we, as the, um, our last presenter from Kansas has shared with us, that advocacy around prioritization of this population for vaccination will be important. It does seem like tier two is where we will end up, but trying to make sure that that's confirmed and there's a plan in every region. Continue to seek help from new allies and never forget that this is really hard on a lot of folks. And so to remember to share gratitude whenever possible. And with that, I'll share my gratitude once again with the coalition and um, happy to continue to um, stay part of this national movement uh, to deal with the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, and let me share our gratitude with you for the work that you're doing in that uh, outstanding uh, presentation. There were a number of um, uh, questions and comments in the chat box in the Q&A if you can hang around and, and respond. I, one or two might be uh, spur, spurring additional more, more involved conversations with, with uh, one of our participants. So thank you very, very much, Lisa. So we wanna move on um, to the very important information about what's happening on Capitol Hill related to coronavirus and the relief package. And so without further ado, let me turn it over to Sarah Sadian, our Vice President of Public Policy, Sarah. Thanks, Paul. Um, thanks for having me on. There's a lot of news here, so I want to make sure that I am providing everybody with 
um, a really comprehensive view of what's happening on the Hill. So we, we have spoken before about a bipartisan group of negotiators that were trying to re uh, reach a deal on COVID. Earlier, they released a framework for a possible deal. And this weekend, they came, uh, they have uh, reached an agreement on legislative text for a relief package that could be added to uh, a spending bill or CR that has to be passed by the end of the week. We expect the bill to be released today at 4 p.m. and we're watching it very closely and we're encouraging um, uh, the leaders to add it to any sort of appropriations bill or CR bill uh, before uh, the deadline on the 18th, which is Friday. So we do know some details about what's in the bill. I wanna go over those with folks now and answer any questions that they might have and then give a sense of what this means going forward from here. So I do want to thank everybody on the call for all of their advocacy over the last several months. Uh, it's been a really uh, tough season, uh, but thanks to your hard work and of course, thanks to the leadership of many members of Congress, uh, this bipartisan relief framework is a really important step forward uh, to where we need to be uh, to make sure that renters are able to stay in their homes and that people experiencing homelessness um, can be stably housed during the pandemic. So I do want to give a shout out to Senators Mark Warner from Virginia, Susan Collins from Maine, Joe Manchin from West Virginia, Portman from Ohio, other members of that bipartisan group, as well as Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer, Speaker Nancy Pelosi, and Sherrod, uh, Senator Sherrod Brown and Representatives Maxine Waters and Denny Heck. Um, all of them working together on different pieces of this have allowed for rental assistance to really rise to the top of any sort of a deal. So what do we know what's included in this? Well, we do know that the bill provides $25 billion in emergency rental assistance and a one month extension of the federal eviction moratorium issued by the Centers of Disease Control that was set to expire at the end of this month. And while um, those, uh, that is not sufficient to address the full scope of needs, it is critically needed and would do a lot of good to help ensure that low-income seniors and people with disabilities, families with children, and other individuals are able to stay in their homes during this global health crisis. So I want to go through the bill in even more detail about what exactly was included and also to let you know that we were working very closely with that bipartisan uh, group to try to make this as strong of a package as possible. We worked especially closely with Senator Warner from Virginia, who has done an amazing job of pushing forward some of our top priorities for this bill. So some details. So the $25 billion in emergency rental assistance is gonna be funded through the Coronavirus Relief Fund, which is administered by the Department of Treasury. We had pushed hard for these funds to go through the HUD Emergency Solutions Grants Program, uh, which is the framework that was used by Senator Brown and Representative Waters in their Emergency Rental Assistance Bill. We were pushing hard for it to be at ESG because of HUD's experience in housing and eviction prevention. Uh, and while we had made some really important progress in convincing other Senate Republican leaders that HUD is the preferred option here. The bipartisan group really leaned towards Treasury, so um, that's where it's headed. The funds can be used to provide both emergency rental assistance and utility assistance, as well as money for stabilization services. So I believe 90% of the funds are gonna be used for rental and utility assistance, 10% of the funds can be used for stabilization services, such as you know, covering the cost of first and last month's rent, uh, rental applications, legal services, and other activities. So even though the money is going through Treasury, we really wanted to make sure that these uses of funds were allowed so that it tracked as closely as possible to the HUD Emergency Solutions Grants Program. Um, also really important here is that assistance can be used for both back rent and forward-looking rent, back utility payments and forward-looking utility payments for a combination of 18 months in total. Initially, we had, been, we had been pushing for that assistance to be provided for up to two years, again, to match the program and HUD's ESG program, uh, but some Republicans especially felt like that was way too long. Initially, they only wanted six months of assistance, so this is another big win 
uh, for advocates. Um, the legislation requires that emergency rental assistance funds prioritize households most at risk of evictions in the coming months. So it requires a preference for households at 50% or below of area median income and a top cap on eligibility at 80% of area median income or below. We, again, had pushed very hard for the bill to use the model that was set forth in Senator Brown and Representative Waters' bill, which had set aside 40% of funds for extremely low-income households, 70% of funds for very low-income households. But there was an enormous amount of pushback from some Republicans who wanted no income targets at all. So, um, and the reason why we pushed so hard on income targets is because we know that without those income targets, Cities and states often divert resources away from households with the greatest needs who are most at risk of eviction. But in the end, I think we got some good language here requiring that very low income households are prioritized, even if there aren't strict income targets included. Another area where there's a big win for advocates is that this assistance is uh, open to anybody who is facing a financial hardship because of the COVID pandemic or during the pandemic. This is uh, a really big win for advocates. We know that um, some Republicans wanted to limit assistance only to those who could prove a COVID related hardship. That would have required uh, or allowed for a lot of documentation requirements, which can be a burden to renters uh, and very difficult for them to prove. You can imagine if you had a job and your, the business went under, you know, how would you possibly get some sort of documentation from your old boss that uh, you were laid off because of a COVID hardship? This is much broader and will serve people regardless of why it is that they're facing eviction, uh, which is really important because we know the health, health outcomes aren't limited just to people who are evicted because of COVID. Um, in terms of an eviction moratorium, the bill provides a one month extension of the CDC eviction moratorium to help keep renters in their homes while the state and local governments are working to distribute aid to households in need. We know that uh, initially some folks wanted to only extend the CARES Act moratorium and not the CDC moratorium. We were very concerned about that. We warned them that if you only provided a CARES Act moratorium, millions of renters would have lost their protections on January 1. That's because the CARES Act only covers federally assisted housing or about 30% of all renters, whereas the CDC moratorium's income targeting includes about 96% of renters. So there's a huge difference here. We were also concerned about how difficult it was when the CARES Act was in place for renters to know whether they were covered. As you recall, um, it depend, whether you were covered or not depended on the type of mortgage your landlord has and who has that information. So uh, at the time, NLHC had created a database that pooled together all of the public information that we knew about, but not all information was available. And in particular, information about smaller projects, one to four unit properties. And finally, we were very concerned that the CARES Act wasn't enough because at the time the CARES Act was in place, we also had state and local moratoriums at the same time and together they made sort of this patchwork of protections that covered a lot of people. But at this point, there are few, much fewer states that have an eviction moratorium. And so the federal one becomes all the more important. So there are definitely some shortcomings of this bipartisan proposal uh, that I think is really important to call out. One, um, you know, the $25 billion in emergency rental assistance is clearly not enough to meet the need. Uh, we're, um, 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 Mr. Zandi was already on earlier to talk about the estimated $70 billion in back rent uh, that is needed. And while $25 billion is, is not enough, uh, it is really uh, much needed, critically needed, to help keep as many people in their homes this winter. And because of the language about targeting resources to people who are most at risk, um, we think that there's a, a good framework here to make sure that people, uh, as many people as possible are able to stay in their homes. Second uh, thing that's missing or shortcoming of this package is that 
We know that extending the CDC eviction moratorium for one month is not enough. And we also are, uh, you know, um, the, the CDC, the package also doesn't address many of the shortcomings that we've discussed on this call about the CDC moratorium, which has allowed landlords to exploit le loopholes and kick people out of their homes. So it's just a straight extension of the existing CDC moratorium. And that will provide a lot of protection, immediate protection to people who are right on the cusp of losing their homes in January. I also want to point out that extending the moratorium through January also gives us an opportunity to engage with President-elect Biden and to encourage them to issue a new strengthened moratorium on day one, you know, quickly after being sworn into office. So it opens the door to further action under President-elect Biden. Finally, this package does not include critical resources that are needed to address the needs of people experiencing homelessness or to address um, those living in HUD or USDA provided housing, another shortfall of this package here. But I will say overall, this is a really critical bill. We need to see it get enacted into law. And so we are uh, encouraging uh, advocates on this call to be talking to their members of Congress and, and urging them to pass this relief package as soon as possible and to return in January to start working very quickly on a comprehensive relief package that's really at the scale necessary to address all of these needs. Um, so in terms of what timing for this going forward, so there is a possibility that this bipartisan compromise package is added to a final spending bill or a continuing resolution for uh, FY 2021, and it could be enacted into law before the end of the year. The current CR, continuing resolution, expires this Friday. At that point, Congress has to pass a spending bill um, to keep the government open or it will risk a government shutdown. I think we expect to see a final uh, spending bill tomorrow, which means that um, things are moving along well. There's a real possibility here. Uh, and we could see both bills, both a spending bill and a relief bill, get enacted into law as soon as by the end of the week and maybe early next week. So I'm going to pause there and see if folks have questions about um, what is included in this relief package and what information you guys need to know about weighing in with your members of Congress to urge them to pass it as quickly as possible. Sarah, there's one question here about the uh... Thinking that they had heard you say there was an 80% AMI cap for eligibility, but later uh, later comments sounded like there was no firm maximum. Okay, so there is a cap at 80% of AMI for all of the funds. We had been pushing for um, income targets within that. So a set aside of funds, for example, that would just be for extremely low income households uh, and more flexibility higher up the income chain. Um, so there is no set aside specifically for populations within that 80% of AMI, but there is a requirement that cities and states prioritize very low income households. We haven't seen the bill text yet, so I'm not 100% clear what that looks like. Um, but considering that many Republicans have been pushing for no income targets at all, we consider this to be a, a real successful step forward. Thanks, Sarah. There are a couple of questions that are kind of related. Uh, one is who will administer, and then another question, will local governments administer the rental assistance or can they subgrant to nonprofits? So the money technically goes out to state and local governments under the Coronavirus Relief Fund, which was also a source of funding in the CARES Act. It is unclear at this time. I don't know the answer to what entities will administer the rental assistance program. I think it's going to be very flexible. I know that many members of Congress were concerned about making sure that this money could be put into existing programs. And so um, I don't have the details on that, but my assumption is that it will be pretty broad about who state and local governments can work with. There are also a couple of questions about how quickly this money will get out to the state. Yeah, so um, I'm, it's going to take some time to get the dollars out the door, which is why we had been pushing for 
uh, an extension of the CDC moratorium for three months through the end of March um, because we wanted to make sure that people were protected for as long as it takes to get the money to households. I don't know. It's going to be a tremendous effort to try to get these funds out um, to reach households in time. Uh, but as I mentioned before, one thing that we're definitely working on is trying to encourage the Biden administration on day one to um, issue an extension of the CDC moratorium and to fix many of the shortcomings with it. Uh, so I don't have a clear answer on exactly how long it would take, but, um, but hopefully quickly. I, I don't have a, a more uh, better answer on that. So um, let's see. There was a question about um, it, since none of the 25 billion would go to homeless services, what about people doubled up in housing? Yeah, so these funds are intended for exactly that purpose. Uh, it's intended to prevent people from losing their homes and therefore being pushed into a situation where they're doubling or tripling up with other households or pushed into homelessness. Um, so I believe those funds would be available for those individuals. In terms of homelessness services, we were really disappointed to see that we weren't able to get additional funds for that purpose. Part of the reason why that is, is that there, um, there's still ESG money available from the CARES Act that hasn't been spent down. And it was really hard for us to make the argument to Congress to expand those resources at this moment. We do know those, that that money is needed. And so we'll have to come back to Congress uh, early next year and to, to ask for the remaining amount of funds that are needed. We estimate about $11.5 billion is needed for the uh, homeless shelter and service providers. Great, Sarah. Well, there are a number of other questions and comments in the chat. Um, if, if you have time to uh, maybe respond to those, uh, you and your staff, that would be great. Thanks a million, Sarah. That's great. Great recap. My pleasure. All right. So to wrap it up, we want uh, to bring in uh, Brooke Dipright, who's a housing advocacy organizer at the National Long Income Housing Coalition. Uh, to talk about uh, the sign-on letter to the CDC to extend, improve, and enforce the eviction moratorium. Brooke? Thanks, Paul. And thanks to Sarah for providing that comprehensive update on the COVID relief package. Um, I'm going to provide a brief update about NLIHC's effort to collect signatures, like Paul said, for a national letter that um, we're circulating, urging the CDC to extend, improve, and enforce the federal eviction moratorium currently in effect. So um, as Sarah mentioned, the current moratorium ordered by the CDC is set to expire at the end of this year on December 31st. And without immediate action, um, you know, uh, hoping that uh, Congress enacts this legislation, but if not, tens of millions of low-income renters will be at risk of losing their home in the middle of winter during a pandemic. Um, so, you know, if, if Congress does in fact enact this package um, with the extended moratorium uh, another month, that's great. Um, but we're calling on the CDC to extend it through March of 2021 to ensure that there's enough time for both the rental assistance funds to get out the door, as Sarah talked about, and for the new administration and Congress to reach a more comprehensive deal that includes a broad moratorium on evictions and at least $100 billion in emergency rental assistance. We're also urging the CDC to strengthen the moratorium by closing loopholes and making it easier for renters to be protected and to enforce the criminal penalties included in the CDC order against landlords who violate the moratorium. So far, we have nearly 1,200 organizations and elected officials who have signed on to this letter, uh, which is a really powerful showing of support, and we continue to see these coming in. Uh, so thank you to everyone who has already signed on and shared with your networks. Uh, for those of you who haven't yet, don't worry. Um, you still have one more day to do so. So this letter will remain open through close of business tomorrow, December 15th. Um, and we invite all local, state, and national organizations, as well as elected officials to sign on. 
um, I or one of my colleagues, it looks like Kim already did, uh, share the link in the chat to the sign on letter itself. Um, that takes you to the letter as well as the form you can fill out to add your organization onto this letter. Uh, for individuals on the call wanting to advocate on this important issue as well, uh, you can still take action by contacting your member of Congress using our email template, um, which I'll also share in the chat um, shortly. Uh, so that's all I have, Paul, and I'm happy to answer any questions people might have. Okay, I'm just looking to see if there are any questions. We've talked about the sign-on letter a number of times on these calls, so uh, maybe it's, uh, no, nobody does have any questions. Uh, I do want to just uh, really encourage all of you. We have 1,200 organizations and elected officials that have already signed on. That's phenomenal. And we would love to have more. So please take action by signing on the letter. It takes like two, three minutes. Um, and then the other thing that's really important is uh, with all that Sarah just shared with us about the coronavirus relief package, now is absolutely the time to reach out to your members of Congress and encourage them to support this package with emergency rental assistance included at $25 billion and a one month extension of the CDC eviction moratorium. Um, just seeing here if there are any questions about the eviction moratorium. Um, no, it doesn't seem that there are. Um, so with that, I will wrap up our call today. Thank you all very, very much for participating. Thank you for uh, all of our presenters. We really appreciate your, your information and, and uh, responses to questions and so forth. And please, everybody on this call, take action. Sign the letter and reach out to your members of Congress about the relief package. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week.